So good evening, everybody. Welcome to Escape Studios webinar about Houdini and um, the sort of application in industry. So my name is Mark Spevic. I'm the head of 3D and course leader and uh, Houdini trainer at Escape Studios. I've got a special guest tonight, um, Alex Budlan. Um, Alex is uh, an escapee. He was one of our very first undergraduates. And uh, since then, he's managed to um, get some very interesting jobs in industry, which um, he's going to talk to us about and tell us about um, how, how he's seen Houdini being used and what kind of skills um, they're requiring for Houdini artists in industry. So he's the man on the, on the street with the, with the latest word. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Houdini itself. I'm assuming people are familiar and know what Houdini is. Otherwise, um, you don't know why you're here, really, because <laughs> we're here to talk about Houdini. So um, it is a very interesting piece of software. And um, it's quite different to other DCCs, um, which are digital cre uh, content creation softwares like Maya or 3ds Max or Blender, in the way that it's procedural. Um, what we mean by procedural is um, similar to like Nuke or Substance, meaning that um, each node, each one of these little icons represents a procedure, a very simple step of something to do. And then it passes the result of the geometry to another one, which does that and so on. And you can rewire these in lots of different ways. So you're kind of building, rather than building a model destructively like you would in Maya, where the changes are not that reversible, in Houdini, um, you're kind of building a system to do stuff. You can model traditionally in Houdini, but people tend not to. So um, the important thing is like, what is the application for Houdini? You know, how's it often used in industry? So from what we tend to see, mostly it's used for a lot of things. It's used for creating environments. It's used for creating effects. It's used for creating tools and building some pipelines. It's used for lots and lots of different stuff. And it's used not just in the VFX industry. It's also used in games as well. And uh, interestingly, Apple are using it to design their um, AI system for their self-driving cars. So that's got nothing to do with games or animation. They're actually building you know, uh, procedural environments uh, to do that kind of thing. The beautiful thing about proceduralism is, as I mentioned, you're not destructively building something like an environment. You're building a set of rules um, where you can change some settings and then you'll get lots of variations of something. So you build a tool that's reusable and you can generate stuff. I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. So the main, if, it, if you boil it all down, really, the two main things that Houdini tends to be used for is creating, as I mentioned, these procedural assets and tools. So these might be tools for everyday working that speed up stuff you do, or more often than not, they're things that will generate geometry on mass. So if, like I mentioned, a big thing that the games are using is using Houdini to generate assets. So you might have a little tool that you've built that generates a building. You play with the sliders, you get several variations of a similar looking building plug that into an asset that then lays it out for a city and you can generate thousands of different cities very, very quickly. You know, and that's the kind of advantage they want because these days with games, games are expanding so much, they need to build so many assets for all these different levels. There just isn't the manpower all the time to do it. So having procedural systems to generate the stuff very quickly for you within a simple style is very, very useful. And uh, they mostly do that through Houdini Engine. Houdini Engine um, is a way of running Houdini in other DCCs like Maya or 3ds Max or Cinema 4D or even Unreal Engine. And um, there's a company, um, I don't know if I should mention their name, they pr produce a, a very popular racing game. And um, they've actually integrated Engine into their own game engine, their proprietary engine. So they're using Houdini artists. So you use Houdini as you know, but the tools actually run in their own game engine to generate these crazy environments because you know just to have artists hand place it all just is not an option these days so that's that's one massive application the other application for houdini is uh within effects you know doing blowing up stuff and doing the hollywood type thing you know destruction and fire fire and pyro and all of that stuff um, which houdini kind of is famous for originally so i'll just show you a couple of examples of this kind of thing so in houdini here you'll see i've got a sphere something simple and i've built some assets so what is a digital asset? Well, a digital asset basically is just another Houdini net network that you've turned into a node and you've promoted certain attributes that you want the artist to control. So these attributes are linked to nodes inside um, and this network sort of I've designed and that's the idea you design these tools and you can get them to do anything. So whatever you can kind of model, you can reuse with parameters. So this one, for example, is called a panelizer. And what you can see is we'll take some geometry and if we look at the triangles on the geometry here, what the panelizer does, it turns those triangles into metal panels for making like spaceships and things. And you can uh, plug in more, um, any geometry you like. And uh, it's up to you. If the way you lay out the topology is how you're going to get your metal panels. 
So you can kind of do it without thinking too much. So let's make a polygon tube. Let's close it up a bit. Let's add some more rows, make it a bit higher. So remember, I'm going to get a panel for each one of these polygons. So if we plug that in and I get this kind of thing. And you'll see I can reuse this asset many times. I could make a copy of it. And now I've got my sphere and my object. And I could start to build you know, a very interesting sort of scene without having to worry about making all these small details. This asset does it for you very quickly. And there's some settings here that you can change. That's the wonderful thing about assets. You know, it's procedural. You know, we can change sort of um, sort of the size of the panel. We can make them smaller, you know, have them have bigger gaps between them or tighten up the gaps between them. If I make bigger gaps between them, we can also adjust the depth of them and extrude them inwards. That probably looks better on a sphere. So let's pop that to the sphere. So there we go. We can extrude them down inwards. So you can get this kind of shape if you want, or you can keep the extrusion off and just tighten up sort of the grids there. And you'll see, because it's procedure, I can just plug in any geometry and it's just going to work with it, with, hopefully without failing. Um, we can also turn on bevel. And look, we can add a bevel to the edges of all these panels that we've put in, put in there. We have bevel controls. We can change the simplicity. We can uh, change the rounding of the edges here. So you'll see the rounding that's high density or flat. Or we could give it a corner. Let's we'll keep it rounded if we want. And then we can control the bolts. And it's up to the artist that designs this for the controls that you want. So that we can offset the bolts from the edge to get the kind of look we're after. Um, we can also change the number of bolts. So you can have less bolts or more bolts. We can change the width of the bolts, make them chunkier or less chunky. We can change the height, make them stick out more or less to look more like rivets. And we can even change the size of them so we can have more sides or you know, whatever shape you wanted, really. So there's quite a bit of control that I built into that. Interestingly, if you search Panelizer tutorial, um, I did do a tutorial for this online. You will find a tutorial on how to build this exact asset. But I'll take you through it very, very quickly because it's quite interesting to see how um, it flows. So if we go inside, essentially what you're doing is taking the geometry. And um, then what I'm doing is, um, where's the node I'm doing that to? That's right. I'm taking the faces here, and then I'm working out the uh, size of the faces, the big ones and the small ones. And then we're working out the area. And then what we're doing is we're extruding this by turning off the uh, sides and the back. So we're basically insetting the faces from the original. And then from here, I'm resampling those edges to create lots of points. And it's these points that I'm going to copy the cylinder that's going to make the bolts. Um, we're then going to fuse any points that are close together that might mess this up. And then we copy the bolts to those points. And because of this extrude, we'll go back to the original geometry and template that. So all the way up here. We might not see that, actually. There it is. It's these, uh, so the original geometry of these gray lines here. And the bolts, because of the poly extrude here on this one here that we inset, that's this gap inwards. And then we copy the points to there. That's how comes the bolts are offset from the edge. We then take uh, do a similar trick on the original geometry again. Again, I'm doing the extrude thing, offsetting it inwards, but obviously not as much as the bolts. Uh, for this is the panel size, so you can make them bigger and smaller. And that's the gaps between them. And then this one extrudes them to give it the depth. This one gives you the option to bevel it. Then we're reversing it to make sure it's the right way around. And then we're merging that with the bolts. And that's basically it. That's the result. So it's fairly straightforward what's going on. And it doesn't matter what geometry you plug in there. I mean, look, we could plug something more complicated in there. For example, the Houdini squab. So a squab actually is um, a, a combination between a squib, squib, a squib, a squid, and a crab. Hence the name squab. Very bizarre thing. Anyway, let's just plug that in with the same settings. It'll take a minute now because we've obviously got a lot more faces to deal with. Maybe I should have simplified it. <laughs> so it'll take a second or two, but then we'll see um, each one of these polygons will turn into a panel with the depth that we set and all the points. Hopefully that's going to kick in shortly. So there we go, it's doing uh, this number down here. See, I've got a little flashy cursor so you can see where our, our mouse is pointing. And is that going to do it now? Yep, it's just going to draw it. 
there we go so if we zoom in you see every polygon now has turned into a metal panel even around the eye detail there Kind of interesting. So there you go, we have a robo squab, and you can save this out to disk and use it for something. So if you get close, you can see it looks like it's made out of metal. And we can build other features in here, like uh, shaders and stuff. So another kind of asset you might do for games, a more typical thing you might do for games, is you might start with um, some geometry. In fact, let's um, just make a slightly more interesting geometry. So I'll just pop a sphere in here. And then what we'll do is uh, just scale it up a uh, scale it up a little, and then we'll add a, a a deformer just to add a bit of shape to it. We'll see where we're going with this in a moment. This will just make it a bit more interesting. And then we can plug into this one here. Now what this does, it converts it into a rock. There we go. So now we have a very interesting rocky looking structure. If I turn off the wireframe, you can see what it looks like there. And you can use this as a game asset and that kind of thing. So um, let me just uh, lower the resolution just for speed. So we can adjust the level of detail here. If I put the um, smoothing on, this, the display, look, we can make it adaptive, for more gain. So we can keep the detail and just reduce the poly count, that kind of thing. Or we can leave it high res if we want, if it's a film asset. We'll have no adaptivity and have the high res mesh. And we can uh, up the resolution so we get more triangles and see more features. And then uh, it's got various controls. Let me just make that lower res. So for example, let me just turn these off and we can see what it's doing. So it's taking our original shape here and then we're adding ridges, sort of these sculpted look on the rocks. We can kind of, you know, adjust the noise, the scale of that, the, no the uh, frequency of that rather and how pronounced it is with the scale. We can add some veins. This is like the strata that you see in rocks, those sort of horizontal lines. And again, you can adjust the noise and frequency. And then we can add some dots. These create the little cavities. And then we can add some general noise just to deform it a bit more. And then you can change all these settings to um, change your rock. And very, very quickly, you know, you can plug in another version and change some of those settings and get a very different looking rock. So let's have a um, higher frequency of dots, for example. Let's have a, a much more pronounced rock. Let's just make that very different with an offset. And then we've got very two, two different looking rocks. Obviously they've got the same shape. And the nice thing about this kind of asset is you can be very fine with your, very unfussy with your modeling. So look here, let me just uh, model something like this where we've got a box. Let me do another box, just give it an interesting shape. So there you go, you could, build, you could build out a rough proxy of some geometry, obviously modeled better than this, to model sort of your cliff face. And what's nice about this is uh, we could just literally just merge them together like that. And there you go, our asset creates nice topology based on those shapes. And this is the advantage of sort of working procedurally in Houdini. Look, if I move one of those original cubes, it all updates and it tries to um, do that rock face. So you could very quickly, you know, build out some geometry and design, you know, a very fast environment using a tool like this. So another thing is, um, again, another one for games is you might want to draw a curve and then very quickly you can build an asset <laughs> that takes the curve, turns it into track and puts it in the terrain for you. And again, you can change some of the settings and make variations of this very, very fast to make um, variations of your game. I mean, for example, if we take the track, we can deform the original curve and you'll see the little mountains change around it, flattens the ground where it wants to um, be. I mean, that's the original curve that I'm just editing. We can see it all updating in real time. Um, so things like the terrain, we can up the res of the terrain, get much higher res or much lower res. Let me just change that number a bit more so you can see that. Oh, let's revert that to defaults. And what's going on there, revert to defaults, there we go. So look, we can up the resolution like this, with the multiplier. We can turn off the noise on it and have it flat if we wanted. We can adjust the noise pattern. So we have more high frequency noise or a lower frequency noise. Um, we can change the distortion in there. There's all sorts of interesting bits that you can do to play with that terrain, should you want to. 
and then um here we can turn the poles on and off if you didn't want the poles or the uh lamp posts or whatever they, they are you want so you can change the number of them the width of them for example the height of them there's all sorts of controls how offset from the track they are <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and then we can change the resolution of the track we can make it much higher res for example or wider or thinner we can make the canyon width wider or closer so there's a lot of controls you know and we could make maybe 10 levels of this very very fast just by drawing the shape of the curves we want so another asset um, that we're going to come to is um, something like this again, where you might want to draw a line and it generates a wall for you. So I've generated a line here. I've got my model of a brick. And then this asset creates a brick wall from those bricks. You can put in any design brick you want and any line. And look, you can edit the line again. So if I just change the length of the line here, you'll see the wall generates with it. And um, if we actually edit the line, so here's the line here. So in the edit node, I can pull these points around. Let's do that in the top view, do something like this. And you'll see the wall updates in real time. So let's deform it like that. So now I've got, I've got a different shape wall. So again, we can just draw a bunch of lines or curves and generate a building very, very quickly like this. And in this asset, again, you know, we can switch the balls, the uh, wall, the bricks direction if you modeled it wrong. Um, we can change the height. We can add more or less to it. We can bevel the bricks so if you look closely we've actually put a softening bevel on the edge of the bricks Ooh, wrong one so you can make the bevel softer or smoother well there's a good start houdini's crashed but here's uh, the same scene again so where were we back to the bricks there we go it did crash but i had it open in another scene there we go so that we can do the bevel there make the bricks a lot softer that kind of thing change the divisions and uh, we can even change the asset actually and create a bunch of dominoes instead of creating a wall so that's really kind of funky and just to show you it's very flexible you know if we were to take our brick again and take rather a large irregularly shaped wall you know we can make a very irregularly shaped um wall here just by moving the bricks around by moving the curve points and you see it's you know this is what the proceduralism is you know you're building an asset that's live and you can adjust stuff and this would work in unreal exactly the same way so the other part that we use this for is the simulation. So that's about the assets. You know, you can create lots of geometry very fast and lots of variations. It takes a while to build one of these Houdini digital assets, the tool. But once you've built the tool, oh, sorry, just having a drink. Once you've built the tool, you can obviously, you know, create huge amounts of geometry very, very quickly after that point. And that's sort of the power that we use in film and in games using it for. The other thing we use it for, particularly in film and in games as well, because they like the effects, is the effects is blowing stuff up so here we've used that asset to create a brick wall for us for example there's the height so what i've done now is um in houdini i've started to uh this node here builds some constraints i'm going to now create some attributes and some properties to this so we can simulate it and that will let us do the uh, destruction there so this node uh, creates constraints so if we just have a look at this pink slot, you'll see it's created these little lines which are connecting all the bricks together. And we call this glue. This node here changes those glue properties. In fact, let me just turn that off for a minute. And then this node here gives it the physical properties of um, a simulation. For example, we can define it down here as being concrete and having the mass of concrete, for example. You'll notice I also have a sphere geometry, which I'm adding some velocity to. This is so I can throw it at the wall. And this also has a configure node, but this one's configured to steel. So this is a lot heavier. Also on this configure node, if we turn on the visualizer, we have what's called active and passive objects. The active objects simulate the passive objects like the floor or these dark bricks are then not movable. They're never going to move, but they're still collide with stuff. So like permanently fixed in place. So they're where the wall's actually actually going to be glued to. So this will never break apart. We can then pack up these objects and merge them into one data stream and then unpack them again for the solver. So this solver puts it all together. So there's our ball and there's our wall. So all we have to do is press play. And you'll see we smash the wall, the ball goes through it. Now, the nice thing about Houdini simulations is the amount of control that we can have to make this seem or feel more realistic. So this isn't that realistic. You know, if a ball was to go through a brick wall like this, we wouldn't necessarily see all the bricks fly up like that. You know, we, we do have a glue here, but we want a sense of um, 
like there's a concrete, uh, there's a, a mortar or something holding the, the structure of the uh, wall together. And we can simulate that kind of stuff with the constraints. If I go back to this constraint here, we can switch the glue when it breaks to a soft constraint. So let me just uh, show you what that does. So if we switch, switch it to a soft constraint, you'll see it now stretches, <laughs> which is quite an interesting effect, but not what we want. But what's important is the impact point here. Instead of having that explosive look and everything fall apart, we're getting this sort of stretchiness, this sense of ductility, like they're still bonded together, but the bonds are in the process of breaking. So what we want to do is actually have this shape and then have it break apart. So what we can do is tell this soft constraint to break when the force or the impact are above these values. So I press play now. You see it kind of bursts through. We get that nice bursting look, which looks much more realistic. And we can play with these settings to control that and how it might look. We can do um, a few other things here as well. Where are we on the constraint properties? We can adjust these propagation iterations. That's an interesting one. If I bring that down, you'll see we get a very small local hole here. And th we didn't get that stretchiness happening around us. It just literally punches all the way through. Because what this iterations does is if I go into a oh, wireframe, in fact, let me um, just pop in a null and then we can see the constraints live from the simulation. There they are. I'll just template the simulation. So what you can see is when it comes in there, it breaks the ones local to it. So the secret to getting this nice sense of ductility is this propagation iteration. So what that means is when you break one of these, one of its neighbors will get enough force and break two, and that's it. If I put this up to 10, that means this one will break plus 10 of its neighbors. So the force will propagate further away and we'll get a bigger hole. And that's what gives it that sense of um, stretchiness or ductility. You'll see as we break that further away, you know, we get a much bigger, a wider gap here and it's allowing these ones to then stretch further with it. So I put the iterations up even higher. Oh, not that high, because we'll break the whole wall. You'll see we get a much bigger gap when it breaks through. If you make it too high, often it will just break the entire wall. There you go, we get into the edge now. So maybe if we do 75. Yeah, we're nearly collapsing the entire wall. Let's do 100. <laughs> And then we, so we, there you go, we've pretty much broke every constraint. But the bricks are still sort of sitting on, on top of each other with friction there, which is why they're not, and they're starting to fall now there, why these ones haven't fallen. Let's put that back to 10, because that was quite a nice look, I thought. So what's nice about this is, um, obviously, we can go all the way back to our original curve. You know, if a director or someone says, I didn't like the shape of this wall, please, can you change it? Go, no problem, I'll tell you what, let's uh, just change it so that we can just move the original curve around, the wall updates, and then we can just simply hit play and see the result of our simulation. I mean, we could do something uh, more interesting. So instead of having a, a, ball, a ball, what we could do is actually um, maybe chuck a pig's head at it instead. So um, what's the translations here? Let me just copy the... Uh, Paste those values. There we go. So put that in the right place. Oh, he's rotated the wrong way. Let's rotate 180 degrees. Maybe make him bigger. And let's throw him at the wall. Bosh. There we go. <laughs> so you could, you know, bring in an animation of a car or something. You know, we've built the system. And then, yeah, we could actually even package all these nodes up into another digital asset. And then all we had to do is plug in the geometry, the brick, and the curve. And then this other asset would control everything that we're doing. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight to sort of the kind of stuff you can do in Houdini. We can do um, sort of build these lovely assets, which you see, you know, fairly straightforward. And we could do much more complicated um, sort of simulation networks to do the effects. You know, we could add fire, we could add smoke to this, we could have it splashing into water, that kind of stuff. And the whole beauty of the procedural system is once you built the network, as you saw, you can go back and change sort of the original geometry and inputs, and you can create lots and lots of variations very, very fast of the setup that you've made. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to invite Alex to uh, pop back. Hi, Alex. Hello, hello. How are you? 
Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for asking. Good, good. Happy That's to good. be here. Thank you. First of all, big thank you for um, agreeing to um, share some of your insights with um, our participants tonight. Yeah, it's That's my pleasure. Very kind of you. Um, so, yeah, I've got some uh, questions that I want to ask you first. Well, first of all, actually, Alex, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. As we mentioned, um, you're, you are one of our first cohorts of doing the undergraduate programme. So um, when you left Escape, um, what have you been doing? Who did you work for? And um, so since I yeah. left Escape, <laughs> uh, I got my first job at UniVFX within a month since I finished uh, year three, which is amazing because initially I thought that's going to take a lot longer. But uh, I worked hard, I got my showreel done, and uh, I landed my first job at UniVFX as an effects artist. So uh, I was there for half a year doing effects, uh, learning, exploring, helping out other people, having fun. And after that, my contract finished, and then I landed my job at DNEG. So in DNEG, I had the opportunity to explore different roles. So I took the role of a sweatbox TD, which is more like a fine link TD that's making sure that a shot is working fine and there's no problems. So there's no shaders yeah. missing. There's no penetrating geometry. There's no crazy animation. So, so a TD, for those that don't know, is a technical director. That's someone yeah. that goes in there and fixes technical things. <laughs> yeah, like a geeky, geeky fella. So, uh, Excellent. Yeah, did, did that. And then I had the chance to work as a Unreal TD. We had a, a six month project uh, that we did in Unreal Engine, which was awesome. And then uh, once that's finished, uh, I got back to uh, effects. So now I'm doing effects. So I've been Brilliant. an effects TD for a few months now. That's really, really varied. Um, you've got your show reel, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah would, you, would you like to uh, share your show reel for everybody so they can see? Uh, sort of the work you've been doing yeah so my show is a bit uh it's a bit older it's like a year old but uh yeah i'll gladly share it if you yeah, are just 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 for the participants the problem with working in industry is um you can't ever put your current work on there because your current work isn't coming out for at least a year so you have to wait for it to be out before you can put it on your show reel yeah <laughs> this is my show reel And if I may, Mike, I also have my our DNEG uh, showreel that uh, I would love to share. Okay, yeah, please do. Excellent work. Thanks. This is some of the stuff that we did uh, in the past couple of years. Yeah, DNEG do great work. Yeah, hang about.
Excellent stuff. Thank you. Yeah, that's some of the amazing uh, work that we do. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing to work with these kind of professionals and in this kind of environment. Brilliant. Thank you so much for showing us those. Um, so um, did you learn Houdini on the course? Yeah, so uh, I knew of Houdini before I started uh, Escape Studios. And I knew that Houdini was used in Lord of the Rings. And they were doing like some crazy effects in there. And I was like, oh, I need to learn Houdini. But then when I joined Escape Studios, I didn't know exactly how I'm going to use Houdini, what exactly I'm going to do in the VFX industry. I knew I wanted to get in the VFX industry. But then we got introduced on Houdini, I think in year one. And then, yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm enjoying this because I'm a bit of a geeky minded person, more technical. Yeah, I enjoyed Houdini and learned uh, learned quite a lot of Houdini, just enough to get me in uh, in my first job. So, um, is that what you were doing at uh, Unit, a Houdini work? At Unit VFX, yeah, I was doing uh, Houdini work, and with with Unit VFX, it was an interesting experience because it felt just like a uni project, like some of the projects that we did at uni, because yeah. everyone's having the same problem, just on a bigger scale. So in, in Houdini, because it's quite a new, well, it's not a new program, but studios are starting to adapt it more and more. And a lot of people in the industry are still old school and just Maya and different packages, different DCs yeah. to do stuff. And I was one, of, I think I was the only one that could render volumes with Arnold in Houdini because we were using Arnold in Houdini. Okay. And whenever we had to do a smoke or anything pyro related, with, uh, with Houdini, you. instead of using Mantra and just sit there and wait for it to do something, they would just give it to me, build a shader, get it going. And then uh, I was making oh, that brilliant. kind of stuff, which was so, like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? So can you go, in, can you go into more detail of kind of um, what um, skills in Houdini you were using at UNIT? Uh, so at Union VFX, I was- Sorry, Union, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was, so mainly a lot of, a lot of uh, particle-based effects. So I was doing, like you saw, a lot of snow, I was doing some rain. I did some uh, rigid body simulations. So like you saw in my showreel where the truck hits the car on the side, uh, I had to do all the glass flying across and I had to make some rough colliders for the characters and um, the airbags. So the glass, when it hits, it just interacts with, the, with that. So it feels more natural. So um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff. And then obviously, pyro work i did some some blood and blood splatters which was interesting but, uh, yeah just kind of like the the general uh, effects you would use initially i thought i'm gonna just gonna do like chimney smoke and that kind of stuff but yeah it yeah. kind of was a lot bigger than that but did you find the stuff that you learned on the course really helped or did you find when you went there you had to learn a lot more again uh actually i took let's say 90 percent of the knowledge that i gained at escape studios i took it with me at union vfx and some stuff that people wanted me to maybe download textures or do other stuff. Um, I was using Substance Painter because we learned Substance Painter at Escape. And I was doing stuff in Substance Painter. And when I told them, like, oh, I can use Substance Painter to do this. And I was like, you know how to use Substance Painter? They were saying, like, yeah. And I was doing that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really cool that I applied everything that I learned at Escape. Okay. Plus the extra bits that I've learned on our specialisms. Uh, I just applied it and just went through. And then obviously... You learn a lot more from the professionals and seniors and ask questions and Absolutely, develop yeah. skills based on the scenarios that you have. So what kind of roles would you say there are for Houdini artists? You know, what are they looking for? Nowadays, I saw that you can have, you can do almost anything in, uh, in Houdini, maybe apart from modeling creatures. But I know people that are, model, are doing textures in Houdini. So instead of using Substance Designer or Mari, they're using um, Houdini to generate all the textures. You can do um, grooming, animation, uh, rigging now because of the new rigging tools in Houdini, you can do some really, really complicated rigging. So pretty much Houdini is starting to be like an all-in-one shop where you can do almost anything, modeling, simulations, rendering, like you have Solaris now and, and um, Karma and packing everything in USD, which is where a lot of companies are going forward now with USD because it's easier data management. 
Yeah, especially across different shows with different outputs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think learning Houdini and knowing how it works and how it runs under the hood gives you a better understanding of all other DCCs. If you kind of know how Houdini works, you're going to have an easier time learning other, other programs. So Aaron, yeah, can you talk about more about your first, how your first job started? What type, how did you integrate the company, etc.? So I started my first job as a junior. So when I got my job, people knew that I'm a junior, I'm fresh out of uni, they loved my showreel, and um, they just got me started straight away. They were having a bit of a giggle and a laugh saying that uh, put Alex through the baptism of fire. So they gave me some, um, a simple task that I underestimated, and it became a bit more complicated. But when you do start in this in the industry, fresh out of uni, people know that you're a junior and people give you time and they give you support. And if you have questions, um, you can ask and, and they'll more than likely be happy to teach you if you want to learn. Yeah, it, it, it depends on the studios, but my experience at UniVFX was great because people were there over there. They were supportive and, and, and they gave me the support I needed to develop my skills on the task that I said they were giving, they gave me, it was just a simple trail behind the character. So it was um, a character where we did some uh, motion tracking and I had to make a bit of a glow that's coming off the forehead of the character going over the head and just kind of like leaving a trail behind. And uh, I, I thought, yeah, just make the collider for the character and then just let the particles just hang in the air. But yeah, after the first version that I did, the director wanted, oh, can you make this? Can you do this? Can you make the particles do this? Can you make them flicker? Can you change it like that? And I was like, oh boy, here we go. But yeah, they they, they gave me enough time and, and support. And um, in the end, they loved what I did and uh, it all worked okay. That's not yeah, sure. so I have a so question is, uh, did learning Houdini help you in your first job? Yeah, it definitely helped me because uh, knowing Houdini, it, it gives you a better understanding, uh, like I said, of all the technicalities that involves Houdini. And, and, and you have a lot more control on what you do in Houdini. And a lot of companies know, I mean, they like Houdini artists and Houdini technical DDs, which is kind of the same thing, um, because they have a more technical head and they have a better understanding of, uh, of the program. And they, can, uh, they know they, they can turn around shots and it, they, do it, they can do iterations a lot quicker. Especially Houdini is becoming the go-to tool in all uh, in most uh, VFX studios. So what, if, if you know one discipline, if you know, let's say, if you know how to do pyro work or, or flip work, which is water simulations, then if you want to transition to muscle simulations, you have an understanding in a way of how stuff works in Houdini. That's why it's, it's easier to transition from one discipline to another. Excellent. So how much C effects goes on in Houdini? For people that don't know, that's character effects. Yeah, uh, a ton, especially now uh, that the side effects are working more and more uh, in developing uh, Houdini. Uh, I don't know a studio that it's not using C effects on a different program apart for Houdini. And, and in Houdini, Obviously, you can use the Houdini tools to do, let's say, clock simulation on characters. But then you also have different plugins that work in Houdini, and sometimes they're better optimized and they can um, they can speed up your work, which is awesome. Yep. But um, yeah, everyone is learning Houdini now because it's a broadly used tool. So like ILM, they have their own in-house tool, Zeno. But then a lot of Houdini users don't want to learn Xeno because once your contract finishes at ILM, you end up with the knowledge gained on the proprietary software and you're kind of getting a bit left out on Houdini. Okay, yeah, so Victoria then... has a question. Do you think that Houdini will surpass software like Maya within the VFX and 3D animation industry? I, see, uh, I don't think so now, but you'd never know what uh, Houdini and side effects uh, are going uh, to do. Um, in the near future. At the moment, Maya is really, really strong in rigging, in animation and in, uh, in modeling. So a lot of studios are using, um, are using Maya for animation. 
when you feel yep. animation, yeah, you, you know, let's say 90% that it's going to be Maya. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think any one software ever replaces another. I think they've all got their pros and cons and their strengths and weaknesses. And yeah. I think most big facilities have nearly every software. It's more up to you as an artist to find the one that works for you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you try to, to do like traditional modeling in Houdini, it, it's 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 kind of like really painful. And people that try to do that, they just lose their patience and go back to Maya. Even though having said that, I know I know a couple of people at Union VFX that I worked with, uh, they were just using traditional modeling in Houdini because they wanted to get the hang of it. Yeah, no, it's it's very feasible. They've got much better tools for doing that these days, much more interactive. Yeah. Yeah. So um, can I ask you um, as well, if anybody else has got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. We'd love to hear your questions. But um, I just want to ask you as well, um, Alex, um, at Escape, um, on the undergraduate course, um, we do do um, a lot of group working and team projects. Um, how does that prepare you for working in industry? Uh, I think that the biggest skill that that one gets from a group project is is um, obviously being a team player, but problem solving. So as let's say you are in effects, like I was uh, in, in effects CD at uh, at Escape, I knew that I had to wait for different assets for different colleagues to get them done, but I knew they had problems, and I could jump out of my effects position and go in in whatever task they were doing and maybe give them a hand or give them some pointers. And uh, it, it gives you a good understanding of the pipeline, uh, uh, the group project, and also gives you a good troubleshooting skill that is very looked at, looked after within the VFX industry. So if you look at all, uh, let's say, FXDD um, uh, positions, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm talking about this because I'm an FXDD, on all the jobs uh, advertisement, adverts they say good troubleshooting skills and and yeah this is one of the biggest skills that uh, i've gained and i made the big use for in um at DNA. yeah a troubleshooting is a problem is always um important because of all the problems you normally get yeah because no one no one likes to to backtrack and dive back and fix a problem but because at, at uh, escape we're having these group projects and you have problems Every even st big studios that have problems, they're just at a bigger scale. Um, knowing how to fix those problems will give you a better value. So, what kind of methods can you uh, suggest for people to help fix problems? Is there any good sort of diagnostic techniques you can use? Um, uh, well, I would say um, kind of like start backtracking and 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 from the point that it goes wrong, uh, backtrack and have patience and try to think what can go wrong. Obviously, you need to have a bit of knowledge on, on the pipeline and how stuff works. But um, I would say a, a good skill to have when you're troubleshooting is to have a good pipeline understanding of how stuff works. And that, because if you know this, you know, okay, so maybe this is broken at the modeling stage or in layout. So you kind of like backtrack. And then, and then if it's okay in, in layout, you can go back to modeling and then try to fix it like that. or that kind of stuff. Excellent. So you mentioned uh, you started with Houdini, then you did some Unreal. Are you coming back to Houdini? I am back in Houdini, yes. So I finished our Unreal project in, um, in June. And since June, I'm on a show now where I am being an FX TD. But because I was a Sweatbox TD and because I've trained the whole Sweatbox team, um, over there because I was the, sweat, the first Sweatbox TD across DNEG worldwide, which is amazing. Excellent. Um, I have the skills of a Sweatbox TD. So I'm, if, if we have a problem, the problem lands sometimes in my hands to fix it and I backtrack and I know the pipeline and I know how, how to fix it. Uh, and also because I have the Unreal Engine skills and now the effect skills, uh, HR and obviously I want to do this as well. They kind of try to keep me on parallel on, on all these three, because this is kind of like a unique skill set that you don't hear all the time. And because I, I did a, a, quite a few roles and I got good at all these three roles, I'm trying to keep uh, within all three at the same time. Now, the downside of this is 
uh, I won't Definitely. have enough time to be perfect at all of them. But since there's a, a big shortage of Unreal TDs and there's, there's um, a shortage of troubleshooters, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick around with these three roles. Excellent. Do you think those three roles are really pushing towards the virtual production? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's more virtual production, it's more cost effective. And if you have Unreal Engine skills, uh, yeah, that's going to put you ahead of a lot of other people. So would you recommend people learning Houdini Engine so they can use Houdini through Unreal? Is that a good, good skill to know? Yeah, definitely. I would encourage people to learn how to use the proceduralism of Houdini uh, and Houdini Engine and get familiarized on how data communicates um, between the software because that will give people an edge. Excellent, brilliant.